Welcome everyone to the May 2021 meeting of the Memphis Astronomical Society. I'm your host, Jeremy Veldman. Got another great and uh, hands-on and informative program for you tonight. We're gonna take you out to Rhodes College, give you a view from the telescope out there as well as the shiny dome observatory. So you get a chance to see some of the actual observing that's going on right here in Memphis, Tennessee. But before we get started, just a few preliminaries. Go ahead and share my screen. First of all, we are the Memphis Astronomical Society, and we are a nonprofit public service organization promoting interest in education in astronomy and related sciences. Our website is memphisastro.org. And of course, you can find us online also. We're on Facebook. We've got a Facebook group. We're on Twitter and we're on YouTube. And if you haven't already, please take a moment to subscribe to this YouTube channel. I want to say thank you to the now roughly 1,900 subscribers to our channel. Hope you get a lot of value again out of tonight's meeting. So take a moment to subscribe if you haven't already. On our website, if you're interested in joining our mailing list, you can do it a couple of different ways. There's a link on the right side. Just click on it called join as well as in the upper right, just a little green our uh, magnifying glass, if you will. And it brings up a separate form. Just fill out your details and we will add you to our email notification list. So that's probably the best way to join our list if you're not on it already. Again, our website is memphisastro.org. You can also go to joinmas.com and enter your name and your email address. And again, we'll put you on our email list that way. We send out notifications about once a week, whether it's upcoming meetings or in this case, observing sessions now that we're opening back up and we're, we're doing more public outreach events again. So things are gonna start getting back to normal, whatever normal is these days. But if you're not on our list already, either go to our website, memphisastro.org, or go to joinmas.com into your name and your email list. And we would love to have you as a part of our community. Now on our website is a calendar of events. And you can kind of see here what's coming up in May. Now tomorrow night, Saturday, May the 8th, we are scheduled to go out to Burton's again. Weather pending, it's a little iffy right now. We will make the final call tomorrow sometime in the early afternoon, whether it's a go or a no-go. So keep your eye out for that if you're interested in doing some observing. We've also got events coming up on the Saturdays subsequent to that. We've got a, a Shelby Farms event coming up on May the 15th, P5 parking area. So keep your eyes out for that. And we also have an event with a Boy Scout scheduled for May the 18th. And this will be kind of a combination of a Zoom presentation and then also an observing session that we're doing sometime between eight and nine o'clock PM. This will be at Germantown Park, I believe near the library on Germantown near Exeter. We'll send details out via email regarding that as well. Uh, we, we may try to move that venue. It's not necessarily the most observing friendly location, observing friendly location because of uh, the lights and the trees. But anyway, Tuesday, May the 8th, we are planning, or May the 18th, I'm sorry, we are planning to do something for the Boy Scouts. And we've also got our next astrophotographer, I'm sorry, our next virtual star party coming up on May the 22nd. And this, of course, is a Tennessee statewide event hosted by Vanderbilt University Dyer, uh, Dyer Observatory. And uh, this, is, this is coming up on May the 22nd. That's the third Saturday, I believe, in May. So if you're interested in viewing that, keep your eyes out for notices regarding this as well. To participate or to, to actually view this, all you got to do is go to YouTube and do a search for Live at Vanderbilt. That's their YouTube channel. And I don't think they have a handle, a specific handle set up yet. So you just got to do a search for live from, uh, live from Vanderbilt and that will take you to their YouTube site. But we will send the specific link out for this channel as well as the specific link out for this event ahead of time. So keep your eyes out for that and the email notices will go out you know, roughly a week or so in advance. And again, that's Saturday, May the 22nd. This is a Tennessee statewide virtual star party. MAS is a participant, we don't host it. Uh, it's hosted by Dyer Observatory, Vanderbilt University. And uh, we have Bayes Mountain 
Planetarium. We've got the Barnard Seaford Astronomical Society. They're involved. We also have graduate students up in, in uh, Canada that are, that are getting involved in this. So it's really spreading and it's really a content rich program. So another opportunity for you to get your astronomy fix, if you will. Our next astrophotography focus group meeting is scheduled for May the 29th. That's the last Saturday in May. Again, we schedule these right around the time of the full moon, hosted by Rick Honey. Don't have a topic yet, but this will be on our website along with the Zoom link. And again, this is an opportunity for you if you want to learn more about astrophotography and get involved. We've got some, we got some experts in our group and some people have been doing this for a lot of years and uh, there's a lot of layers to astrophotography. So it's a great opportunity for you to learn as well as get involved. So we will post information about that, but mark your calendars ahead of time for May the 29th, last Saturday in May for our next astrophotography group meeting. And I believe that's at 7 p.m. Central Daylight Time. Okay, I want to take a moment to welcome some of our newest members. And again, I'm not going to put you on the spot by calling you out tonight. We have a long-standing tradition within the in the Memphis Astronomical Society of uh, people not um, actually showing up when they become new members. But uh, I just want to give a shout out to Andrew Ward, who was approved on May the 14th. And Andrew is a science teacher right here in Ar at Arlington High School in, in Tennessee. Welcome to our group. Happy to have you on board. Also want to welcome Don Abernathy, who is from South Haven, Mississippi. And he actually found us on our YouTube channel. And uh, he's basically a hobbyist, just interested in learning more about astronomy. He's the vice president of Smith Doyle Contractors Incorporated. So Don, welcome to our group. We're happy to have both of you as new members of the Memphis Astronomical Society. Now, when you become a new member, you get, ask, you get access to the Meteorite, which of course is our newsletter. And this has some great information, such as a calendar of events, astrophotography gallery, got some great images from Cameron, one of our astrophotographers on our, on our Facebook page. Check out some of his stuff as well as minutes from the past board of directors meetings and then a uh, sky map from for whatever month. In this case, particular case, it's May. So check out the meteorite in this month's edition. As far as what's happening in the news, um, probably the event that's, that's caught the headlines within the past month is the successful flight, the first successful flight of a man-made spacecraft on an alien world. In this, particular, in this particular case, it would be the Ingenuity helicopter taking its first flight on the surface of Mars. So this took place a couple of weeks ago in April. You can see an image of it there on nasa.gov. And it wasn't a long flight, about 39 seconds. It wasn't very high, about 10 feet. But to do this in an atmosphere that's about 1% as dense as Earth's um, with a, with a, with a, a craft, a man-made craft, if you will, is, is quite an accomplishment. So. From 1903, the Wright brothers first flight here on earth to 2021, the first flight on an alien world, a little over a century of time, a lot of progress has been made. So quite an achievement. And there are other events of course that have, that have occurred as well in the world of, of astronomy. So check that out. Now, a couple of things I wanna bring your attention to as far as what's going on locally. Again, I mentioned this last month and our friends over at the University of Memphis are in the process of implementing and setting up, if you will, a scale model of the solar system. And um, this is the Voyage Solar System Scale Model and it'll be on the, the campus of the University of Memphis. And uh, this really gives you a sense, once you walk this, of just how vast our solar system is in terms of just the spaces between the planets. So it really will be quite something to get this, not only for the University of Memphis, but I view this more as a, as, as a Memphis community project, if you will. So just being able to have something like this in the city of Memphis would be a great accomplishment. And they're in the process of raising funds for this. And you can check out more on this, uh, at the link on this website right here. So if you're interested in learning more 
and maybe even possibly making a donation, just go to this link, momentum.memphis.edu slash project slash 25271. There, <clears throat> there are different levels of donation, you know, that you can do. It doesn't have to be much, but over time it accumulates. And of course you can see their goal here. They're about 13% of the way there. The deadline now is uh, July 31. They do have some other donors that are in, 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 in process of, of giving you this project as well. But either way, it will be exciting when we actually get this in, in the community within Memphis to see a, a scale model, if you will, of the solar system. So again, if you wanna contribute or if you just wanna check it out and learn more, check out this link right here. And uh, we're, we're, we're looking forward to the time when this is actually up and implemented sometime next year. Okay, for everyone on the call tonight, I will have a link to these two documents in the description below. And that of course is our May sky chart. It gives you the constellations that are out this time of year. We're still in the throes of galaxy season, which is, you know, the spring season. So if you're, if you're, if you're interested in that, I'll have a link to the May sky chart, as well as our membership application in the description below this video. And again, if you'd like to become a member, just go to our website, join, just go to our website and click the join button, or you can download this application right here, fill it out, all the forms are pre-filled, and then email it back to us at info at memphisastro.org. So quick and easy, the approval, the approval process is, is uh, pretty streamlined now. So we would love to have you as a new member of our organization. So again, I'll have links to these two documents in the description below. All right, so that leads me into tonight's program. And for those of you who have followed the local news recently, uh, Rhodes College has some pretty exciting things going on. They have contracted with NASA to develop um, satellites that are gonna go into space. And uh, it was written up in the commercial appeal a couple of weeks ago, as well as the Daily Memphian and this is a, uh, a NASA funded project, if you will, that selects Rose College for student made satellite launch. It's one of 14 mostly colleges and universities that selected for CubeSat launch initiative. And this is a science to the people program, gives teachers a platform to build hardware, hardware that will orbit the earth. And uh, Rhodes will test tiny solar cells about a millimeter square in the ravages of space. And really space is, space is a harsh environment for testing electronics. So uh, Rhodes has been uh, in, involved in this initiative now for about a year. And uh, CubeSats are a type of small spacecraft in their smallest form. They measure about four inches on a side, weigh less than three pounds, and they have the volume of, of about a quart. So this is some pretty exciting work that's going on locally right here in Memphis with uh, Rhodes College and then also I believe the, the collaboration with the University of Oklahoma, hence the term Roke Stat. So our presenter tonight is Dr. Ann Viano, and she is the, she's involved in this initiative. She also teaches physics and astronomy at Rhodes College, and she is an active board member with the Memphis Astronomical Society. So we are very honored and very privileged to have her as a part of our organization. And she's made a, an immense contribution to our club over the past year. And it's projects like this that just really bring a lot of excitement into the local community. So tonight, Anne is gonna take us on a tour of the Rhodes Observatory. And if uh, you've been to the Rhodes College campus, it's very impressive. It's a beautiful campus, it's a beautiful facility. They have a 20 inch plane wave telescope and during the uh, summer months, and I believe in the fall as well, they have, you know, pre-COVID, of course, they have um, open observatory nights on Wednesday nights where they show you views through the telescope. So, and I think, you know, as things open up, we'll get back to that. But at this particular point in time, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Ann to take over the program and show us what's going on at Rhodes College. So Ann, take it away. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, if you could stop sharing your screen, I can take over. 
So thanks everyone for coming. Um, I am in the observatory, so my voice may sound a little echoey. Um, if, it, if you're having an issue, somebody put it in the chat, Freddie, or somebody tell me if the audio is hard to hear. Um, it's just a very noisy environment in here. Thank you. So as you can see, I am in the observatory. Uh, the telescope is behind me. The slit is open. And um, about an hour and a half ago, the skies look like this. This is from the outside of the observatory. This, the skies were pretty clear. However, we now have a, a nice layer of clouds. So we won't be doing any live observing, but that's OK. Um, I have something prepared. And I will get to it here as soon as I switch screens and share the appropriate one. OK. So hopefully you're seeing that. And let me undo what Zoom likes to do every time I share a screen. There we go. OK, um, please interrupt me if you have questions as we're going along. We're kind of a small group here. So please, I like this to be really casual, although it might seem really formal. Um, so tonight I'm going to be talking about the observatory. Uh, it really has nothing to do with the CubeSat project that Jeremy was just talking about that was recently in the paper. That's a, a different um, aerospace engineering project that's going on in, in the department. But tonight we're talking about the observatory. Um, and so I wanted to start by talking a, a little bit about the history of observing at Rhodes. Sorry, I've got a Zoom thing in the way. It's kind of annoying. Um, here we go. We'll try and put it over here. Um, so in days of yore, so in the last century, um, Rhodes has, the physics department has always been active in observing objects, events, um, most notably in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, the department was focused on solar astrophysics. And the big thing was to chase eclipses to study the solar corona. And so here's a picture here of Dr. Rhodes himself, Dr. Rhodes was a physics professor before he became president of the college and then namesake of the college. Um, this was one of many trips that the department took to observe a total solar eclipse and take photographs and observations of the solar corona during the eclipse. So you see the truck back here says uh, Southwestern at Memphis. Um, down here is a picture of a large infrared telescope that the department built from scratch, put it on a ship, took it to Alaska, and then put it on the back of a flatbed truck, drove it out to the middle of nowhere in Alaska to observe totality of this particular eclipse. Uh, this was in 1963, this particular trip. Uh, they also took trips to Kenya uh, for another eclipse. There was another observation of an eclipse where they actually went in an aircraft, cut a hole in the roof to stick a telescope out the roof of the aircraft, and then they could follow the path of totality and get a longer observation. So there's always been an interest in observing. And I thought we'd have some fun here. This is uh, a picture from the 60s showing um, Dr. Jack Taylor is here in the white coat with the bow tie. And this is some of the new, back then, the new equipment that was connected to devices on the roof for studying radio, uh, radio observations. And I thought I would just ask a little question here. So this photo shows Dr. Jack Taylor in the white coat, and he's showing this new you know, space age equipment to a very special visitor they had one year. So I thought I would ask you, who is that visitor? So I'm gonna launch a poll and you should see some options on your screen and you just tap or click on the appropriate one. And we'll see if everybody can guess who this is. So about half of the people have voted so far. I'll give you another 30 seconds or so. And if you've never done a Zoom poll before, you, you may not know what I'm talking about. You can't find the poll screen. That's completely OK. All right, so I'll end the poll and I'll share the results. And we have a very smart group here because the majority went with choice C. It is, in fact, William Shatner 
the one and only Captain Kirk. Um, he visited Rhodes in 1969 um, as part of sort of a Hollywood promotional tour. The first season of Star Trek had just aired and, and it didn't do as well as they had hoped. So they sent him on a goodwill tour across the country and he stopped at Rhodes College because there was this new kind of observatory equipment. And so he got to come and see the equipment. And if you notice his hand here, he's giving the Vulcan salute there, right? With his hand, so very appropriate. Uh, I'm a big Trekkie, so I, I love this. And I love that the people in this group know who William Shatner is. When I show this to my students, of course, you know, they, they don't know anymore. Um, they used to back in the day. All right, so let's talk about um, the observatory. In 2015, the physics building underwent a, a huge renovation. The building was completely gutted and totally rebuilt. However, the outside shell remained pretty much the same. So on the left is the before picture, and we had two observatory domes. Uh, the north dome had that big infrared telescope that I was showing you, that big behemoth that was driven around on the back of a flatbed truck, um, was mounted on a pier in this uh, south dome. The North Dome had a Celestron 14 inch Schmidt Cassegrain telescope. And this was the telescope we used for public events, for astronomy class. Um, it had tracking, and that was about it. So you had to manually find the object of interest, and then it would track. But sometimes it was pretty hard. We're right in the middle of Memphis, and there's a lot of light pollution. Sometimes I couldn't even find the Orion Nebula. So it was hard to use, but we had a lot of fun using that. Um, and I think now it, it is at French Camp down in Mississippi. After the renovation, you may notice that the North Dome is gone. And what is in place, you can barely see is, this is actually the aerial that is going to be the radio antenna so we can talk to our satellite, our CubeSat. But we got a new dome on the south end of the building and that's the dome I'm in. Uh, tonight. So when designing a new observatory, uh, you have to think, what are the goals? And of course, being an educational institution, our main goal was student learning. So we wanted a facility that could be used in our astronomy and astrophysics class. We also teach an observational astronomy class at the upper level. We wanted something that could be used for student projects. So we were thinking about things like tracking variable stars, looking at their light curves, trying to find exoplanets. There are ways to participate in exoplanet findings. And then of course, doing some astrophotography. We also wanna be able to use it for campus events. We like to look at transits when they happen. We wouldn't use the telescope for an eclipse, but we usually have a big event, so. Um, and then our second goal, of course, is outreach to the public. We, we really have a mission at Rhodes to uh, inspire our community to, to have a love of learning and to get interested in things like science for our department. So as Jeremy said, we have open houses for the public, which hopefully will be resuming in the fall. I'm not sure if they'll be on Wednesdays though, so watch our Facebook page. And then we, we, do, we used to do a lot of special viewing events for schools and other groups, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, homeschooled, um, just a number of different events. So we wanted an observatory and a facility that would meet these goals. And so we ended up with what we have. I wasn't especially involved in the decisions about what was purchased, but I've, I've since sort of taken over the operation of the observatory. So the things that we're gonna talk about tonight are, um, we obviously we have a dome and you can see it above me. Uh, we have a telescope and I've kind of put numbers in a sketch here. Our telescope, this big pink tube, is on a polar mount, and we've got two motors. If you know what a polar mount is, it allows your telescope to point directly at the pole, the North Pole star, and then you have two motors that move in declination and right ascension, which are basically latitude and longitude on the sky, on a, on a grid that is aligned with the north-south axis of the Earth. Um, we have an automatic focuser behind the telescope, we then have a rotator, which I'm not gonna talk much about. It just allows you to rotate the camera to frame your, your image. And then we have a really nice large format camera. All of that is connected to a Windows PC. 
We also have a weather station out on the roof that is connected up to the dome and the system so that if it starts to rain, the dome will automatically close. And then we also have a webcam in the dome itself because all of this can be done remotely. Almost all of this can be done remotely. And so to have that webcam to be able to see that everything's operating properly is a, a good idea. So before I get into the parts, are there any questions or anything? Okay. Um, I'll go on. Um, so I had a video inserted here because I wasn't sure how the night was going to go, but I'm here in the dome. So this is what it used to look like. This is that old infrared telescope. Um, you can see a student here. This was probably the last student to ever use this behemoth of a telescope. It never had good tracking. The, the pier was a little bit unstable, so there was vibration. Um, it just was kind of a white elephant in this dome. The new, tele the new dome has um, a, a beautiful plane wave 20 inch telescope. You, uh, Jeremy showed some pictures of it. And you can see the slit of the dome open in this picture. And I'll try to show it behind me. It's, it's a little bit tricky. So the dark is the slit. And we also have a dropout that is closed at this time. All right, so I just wanted to talk about the different parts, show you some things about image processing, and then we can try it out if you want. Um, even though it's cloudy, we can at least move the telescope around and I'll show you how, how we would actually operate things. So the dome we have is from Ash Dome in, in Plainfield, Illinois. They make observatory domes. Um, it's an 18 foot diameter dome. So there's enough for the telescope, for a countertop, uh, me, a couple of chairs, uh, and some people to come in. Um, so we have that dropout and the slit. The dropout is this bottom part and it folds outward away from the dome and then the slit opens up and down. Um, the controller is this big gray looking panel on the right. That is from ACE Smart Dome and that is what is interfaced with our computer so we can control the dome. And we also have some lighting in the dome that allows us to have bright white lights, which I have turned on right now, or I can have just red lights. So for when we're observing, we want to keep our night vision, we would go to all red lights. So we are actually, Rhodes is right on the path, the north-south path to Memphis International. So there's a plane going overhead. Okay, so let's talk about the telescope itself. So you saw a picture of it earlier. Um, this is a 20 inch or a 0.5 meter plane wave corrected doll Kirkham, which just refers to the way its optical path is corrected for certain imperfections in the shape of the mirror. It has a carbon fiber truss. And in fact, while I'm talking about it, I'll, I'll point it up there at it. Um, normal operation, we keep a, a cloth shroud and I can use my laser pointer maybe. So maybe you can see my laser pointer. Uh, we have a cloth shroud that covers the carbon fiber truss just to inhibit some of the dust. But I pulled the shroud up to take these pictures so you can actually see the carbon fiber truss. And in this picture on the right, you're seeing the main mirror of the telescope, which is at the, the bottom end of the telescope. In this picture on the left, you're seeing the secondary mirror. So this is a classic reflector. The light comes in hits the main mirror, bounces up to the secondary mirror, then it goes down this tube and into our camera system, which is on the back end. Um, the focal length is 3.454 meters and the focal ratio is 6.8. So it's not a super fast telescope, but it's not a slow telescope either. It's kind of right in the middle. And this focal ratio just refers to the focal length divided by the diameter of the telescope. So a long skinny tube has a high focal ratio, a short fat tube has a low focal ratio. Uh, the picture in the middle just shows you the motors. Um, so this is the mount. And then we, you can see this black uh, circular object with a square bottom. That's one of the motors, that's the right ascension motor. And then a similar structure up above, that's the declination motor and they are interfaced and all uh, back to the computer so that they're controlled. 
Okay, on the back end of the telescope, sort of the business end, we have a lot of equipment kind of crammed in there. So this is the back of the main mirror. Right behind that, we have the electronic focuser. So that allows us to move the mirror back and forth and focus the telescope. Behind that, we have a rotator, which again, just rotates the camera so you can frame your image. Then this large structure is the filter wheel. And we have a set of filters in there that we can rotate the filter wheel and put the appropriate filter in front of the camera. And then finally at the back, we have a, a nice big large format camera, CCD camera that is actually cooled. So all of our pictures are always taken at the same temperature, which is really helpful. On the right here, you can just see how the mount is connected to a concrete pier. And you can see some of the counterweights that we have so that we're not stressing the motors. One problem with this gray box at the bottom, this is a concrete pier, but it only goes down to the floor below. We are on top of a five-story building. So um, we do have some vibration. Ideally, you would want this on the ground somewhere out in a remote area, but we take what we can get here. So we do have some problems with building vibration because this pier is just connected to the floor below. Okay, so our camera and filters. Um, so on the left here, I just put a picture of, you know, this is where I'm sitting. Just right a now. question before oh. you continue. Yes. Um, are the motors stepper motors or are DC motors? That's an excellent question, Freddie. I don't know. Okay, that's fine. Sorry. That's fine. So on the left here, um, that's just a picture of where I'm sitting. So you get an idea, uh, the telescope's behind me and then we have a little desk. Uh, the countertop actually goes around the dome. And I know a couple of you have been up here and I hope many of you will get the chance to visit when we start having open houses again. So our big CCD camera is an S big STX 16803, which is quite a mouthful. Um, like I said, it's cooled to minus 20 C. So all of our images are always at the same temperature, which is great because then you can take dark frames anytime you want because you're always at the same temperature. Um, the image size, it's 4,000, almost 4,100 square pixels. Each pixel is nine microns. And that gives us a field of view of a little over half a degree. So 37 arc minutes square is our field of view. So about a half a degree on the sky is what we can image. We have a guide camera, sort of a pickoff mirror, a pickoff camera that I'm still learning how to work with. And in our filter wheel right now, um, this is kind of a weird filter wheel because they don't make it anymore. It takes 65 millimeter square filters, which are very large and therefore very costly. Uh, right now we have a luminance filter and we are using some Sloan filters, which you may not have heard of. So I, I put a little graph here showing you which wavelength bands these particular filters pass through. And they are GR and I, which has nothing whatsoever to do with color. So it's a little bit confusing. The G filter is basically blue. The R filter is basically letting in green and the I filter is basically letting in red. So when we do color imaging, we have to remember RGB is IRG, it's just tricky. We also have an H alpha filter, so we can take images in H alpha. One upgrade that I would like to uh, do with this scope is to purchase a better filter set for our environment. These are not the best filters for a light polluted city. Um, I think the next time we have some excess budget, whenever that is, we will upgrade our filters. Okay, a little bit about system integration. This is the hard part. <laughs> and where I spend most of my time is making sure that all of this works. So I tried to do a little flow diagram here. So we have our weather station, which is out on one side of the building, but it is integrated into the dome and, and the computer so that if it rains, the dome should close. Um, the dome itself is connected through an internet connection, TCP IP, that's connected to our computer that we access through the computer. The telescope itself comes through USB to our PC. The focuser and the rotator come also through USB 
and the filter wheel connects to the camera, which also comes through USB to our PC. So we need a really good PC to keep all this running. And ideally it would not be running Windows 10, which doesn't play nice with a lot of things, but it's what we have right now. Uh, the little lightning bolts, these are all parts of the system that require power. So fortunately we're in a fixed structure and we have electrical power, but I know a lot of you work remotely and you have to think about how are you gonna power all of these different devices. I have another question. Where yes. the guiding camera connects to? Oh, the guiding camera, um, da -da 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 -da. It's, it's connected to the camera itself. So to operate all of this, there are lots of different options. Um, we have you know, the, the software that came with the dome controller. That turns out to be the only way we can operate the dropout, which is the lower panel to get low in the sky. Um, for some reason, it doesn't play nice with the new ASCOM platform through other things, but so we can control the dome several ways, but we can do this particular piece of software if we need to close or open the dropout. All of these devices are using an ASCOM driver, so they should be able to talk to multiple pieces of software. So if we want to connect to our telescope, we have to start with the software that came from plane wave just to initiate the connection. But then we have some options and we have basically two software packages that allow us to do almost everything. And one is the Sky X Professional and the other is Maxim DL. And everybody has their preference. Um, we like to use the Sky for connecting the dome to the telescope uh, because we had to pay for that option. Um, it's also a nice way to move the scope around because you get a nice map of the sky and you can see where it's moving. We can also use the sky to operate the camera and the focuser and the rotator. But for taking images, I prefer to use Maxim DL. It just has nicer capabilities. So we could use Maxim DL to do all of this. I, I usually use it for the camera and maybe a few of the other objects. We also have some separate focuser software that we can use. Um, it really just depends on who's operating it, you know, what they prefer, uh, what software they're most comfortable with. All right, so I wanted to talk a little bit about imaging since that's mainly what this telescope does. We, we do not uh, look through this telescope with the naked eye. We did once when it was brand new, we took off the camera and put in the eyepiece connector and a big you know, eyepiece and we were looking because it was exciting and it was new. But with this kind of telescope, you have to shift everything. You have to shift the main optical tube on the mount. You have to adjust the weights when you switch to the eyepiece. So it's quite a production. I had to get a couple of football players in here to help me slide the big optical tube to the correct position because we were afraid if we let go too fast, it would fall. Um, so we typically just keep it set up for photography. So taking images um, is not an easy skill or not an easy thing to do. And I am definitely not one of the skilled. There are some in this group who are really skilled at this. Um, it's not as easy as just taking a single picture. Um, you have to collect images and not just one image. You collect many images. And with our particular system, our camera is monochrome. So it only takes you know, one color, a grayscale image. So you have to collect images through all the different filters if you wanna make a color image. So there's a lot of time spent just collecting images through the filters. You also have to calibrate the images. And this is a really important step you have to remove noise from the CCD sensor and there are several different kinds of noise and there are imperfections in this, the way the sensor operates. So calibrating those images requires um, a lot of knowledge and experience uh, using software to do that. If you take a hundred images of an object, you then have to align those images so that the stars are perfectly aligned. And then you have to add all those images together or integrate them so that the light is combined from your 100 images to give you one pretty image with lots of, of information. And then when you do all that, you're not done because there's a ton of processing, post-production processing that has to be done before you get even a pretty picture. So 
Uh, I thought I'd put a, an image up here of something that is familiar. Does anybody recognize this constellation up here on the upper right? Sure, Pleiades. Pleiades, right. I knew people in this group would get it. So this is the Pleiades, and the yellow box represents our field of view. So you could see if we were to take a picture of the Pleiades, it doesn't quite fit, it kind of fits. You, you would have to you know, adjust and decide what you want in the field of view. Or you could do multiple images in what's called a mosaic to take a larger, a picture of a larger field of view. Uh, this is a picture of kind of what the inside of our filter wheel looks like. This is a seven filter wheel. Ours is a five filter wheel, but it, it behaves very similarly. And then these are what the filters look like that you attach to put in the filter wheel. Okay. Um, this might be a good time to operate the telescope a little bit and let you see it move and ooh, wow. And then we can come back and talk about image collection. Does that sound reasonable? Okay, so oh, I'm gonna uh, switch over to some software here. So this is the Sky, the Sky X Professional. Hopefully you can see that. Is it still sharing? Okay, thank you. Um, so right now, what you're seeing is the yellow circle is where our telescope is pointed. It should be pointing at Polaris. The slit behind it is sort of where our observatory slit is positioned. Um, it's not perfectly accurate, um, especially right now because it's not quite centered. But because it's running through an ASCOM driver, the, the graphics aren't exactly perfect. But the slit is centered on the telescope every time uh, in person here. So uh, we can move somewhere. Looks like the sun has just set, but like I said, it's, it's really socked in with clouds. So let's, let's just move to Arcturus. So I select where I want to go. I go over to SLU and I just say, yes. So I have the dome connected and the dome is gonna follow the telescope and when the dome starts to rotate, it's incredibly noisy. So I won't be able to hear you until the noise stops. So bear with me here. So we're gonna go to Arcturus. Okay, and the software talks to me. I don't know if you heard it. So now the slit is pretty much right above me here. Um, when it's done slewing, it tells me slew ended. So we're at the position of Arcturus. We can zoom in. And eventually, if you set it up properly, you get your telescope field of view. So we could see you know, what it would look like if we were to take a picture of Arcturus, you know, we could center it uh, in our field of view. It, it's going to fit just fine. Um, pretty exciting. Uh, Arcturus is not much to take a picture of, but you get the idea of how this might move now. Uh, let's see if we can show something else. There are so many bells and whistles in the sky that you can turn things on and off and when working remotely from home, the more graphics I have turned on, the slower it is. So I tend to keep it to a minimum. Does anyone have an object they would like to pretend to go and look at? We can't really look at it because of these clouds. How about M3? M3, I was just doing some imaging of that. So we have a nice feature here. We click find and you can just type it in. And it will show me where it is in the sky. It's actually close to our current position. Again, I would just say SLU. Telescope is moving. And it was very fast. It was very fast because we didn't have far to go in the sky. So if we wanted to take a picture of M3, we would open up Maxim DL. We would set up the camera. Um, it would be wonderful. And for some reason, it's not showing up on my display here, but I may have that setting just turned way down. 
All right, so that's sort of the basic operation. You would slew to your object, you would focus the telescope, you would start collecting images in each filter and build up you know, your, your folder full of images. And then you would work on processing that data you know, offline or however you would wanna do that. So let me go back and talk about that a little bit because it is a complex process. Um, so when we're collecting images, there are lots of different types of images. So light images are images of the object. So we just slewed to M3, M3. We would take images of that object through each filter. We might take 10 images through the luminance and then 10 through the I, R, and G filters that we have. And maybe H alpha if it was an object that had a lot of hydrogen in it. Uh, there are other kinds of images that you need to actually calibrate your data. Um, the first is called the bias. Um, basically, any CCD sensor has some electrical noise associated with dumping that data out of the sensor. So to get a bias image, you take a really short exposure in the, in the dark, and that just records this noise that has to do with reading out uh, electronically, reading out the data. Dark images correct for thermal noise of the sensor. And so a CCD sensor is very thermal, uh, very temperature dependent. The hotter it is, the more noise there's gonna be in the sensor. And so you need to subtract out that kind of noise. Uh, now, like I said, our camera is always at the same temperature. So it makes it really easy. We can build up a library of darks and, and we don't have to take a dark every time we take images because the camera is always at the same temperature. But basically you just take images with the shutter closed and you want them at the same exposure time and the temperature as you took your light images. So you take your images of the object and then you've got to take dark images at the same exposure time because the, the noise also depends on the exposure time. Flats images are I think the hardest ones to get. I'm still working on this, but this normalizes the readout across your CCD sensor. So you might have some parts of the sensor that read out a little bit higher brightness values than other parts. And you wanna normalize it so that every region of your CCD sensor gives you the same reading for the same amount of light. And so this type of image will allow us to account for the fact that it's, it's not perfect, uh, this, this readout error. And to do this, you wanna take pictures of something that is evenly illuminated, preferably white, and you just want it at an exposure time that is not saturating. So you don't want the pixels to be saturated, maybe you know half, half illuminated. For a lot of folks I know in this group who observe with a portable telescope, they will just put a white t-shirt over the telescope and then shine it at a, you know, a, a perfectly white computer screen, or you can shine it at the sky at a certain time of day, you know, twilight time, just to get a nice even illumination. We're in a permanent setup and I don't know if you can tell, but this telescope is really big. So it's really hard for me to climb up to the top. I have to get on a tall step ladder and I would put a white cloth over the top of the telescope. And then I would shine it out at you know, twilight. And I've done that, that those are called sky flats, but it's really kind of labor intensive. And to, to put a white sheet over the top of this telescope is gonna introduce some more dust, which is gonna change the way the flats come out. So it's just not a good idea. The other method is to use a flats box. And this is a picture of our flats box. It's attached to the side of the observatory and it can connect up. It's, it's a basically a opaque plastic screen with an evenly illuminated surface on the back side. We use some LED strips to evenly illuminate this white surface and we point the telescope right at it. We try to get it exactly centered and then we can set the illumination to the appropriate value and we can take our flats. Ideally, you wanna do this after every imaging session. And so it's a little bit time intensive. It does require right now someone to be in the observatory to hook up this flats box. Um, we have to hook it up to power in order to do it. So I'm working on a way to make this easier for us 
this flats box was originally designed to actually go on the business end of the telescope, um, but that's rather unwieldy to do. So it, it's a little bit small for using on the wall of the observatory. So this summer, the project is to make a larger flats box so that it's easier to point our telescope at it. Finally, you have thermal noise in the images that you took for the flats. So you have to do some more dark images, but at the exposure time that you used for the flats. So before you can even get a picture, a pretty picture, you have to take all of these different types of images and then you need to process them. And that is what I am learning uh, so much about with our astrophotography focus group. So I'm just gonna talk about a couple of parts, not everything because that would take several sessions, um, but image calibration. So you take all of these different images, how do you put them together? It, it looks complicated on this slide, but in reality, software will do it all for you. But in scientifically what's going on is you have a light image. So you have an image of an object. And can you guess what object this is? I picked a really recognizable image. M42. There you go. So the Orion Nebula. So let's say you, you took a picture with a particular filter um, and then you have a dark image. So you close the shutter and you take a picture at the same exposure time and the same temperature. You took a flat field image and some darks that you've used to calibrate that particular flat. So the flat image through the same filter and then the bias image, just the really short exposure to get the readout noise. The way these are combined in most software packages, um, it might vary a little bit. Every astronomer has a different method, but the lights, uh, the darks are subtracted from the lights and the biases are subtracted from the flats. And then they're combined in this way. The light minus dark are divided by the flats minus the bias. And then you end up with a, a nice calibrated image, one image. So maybe that was one image through your green filter. And maybe you took 50 images through your green filter and 50 images through your red filter and 50 images through your blue filter and 100 images through your luminance filter. You have to do this for each image. But like I said, the software will do it all for you. Um, you just have to learn the software, which can be hard or not so hard, just depends. So if you wanna do color imaging, you would do this for each filter, right? A red, a green, and a blue. So maybe here I have five images that I took through a red filter of the Orion Nebula, and they've all been calibrated. So I've gotten rid of all the thermal noise and the electrical readout noise by going through that procedure on the previous slide. Then I wanna align these images. So line them up so the stars are overlaid on top of each other. And I basically want to add these images up. I want to integ integrate the, the light information in these images. And I might end up with a picture like this. So this would be a master image in say the red filter. And I would do the same thing for the green filter and the blue filter. Now, remember we're using these Sloan filters, which is why it says I, R, and G, but you could think of it as red, green, and blue. So you would go through all of that and get a final image for each of your colored filters. And then you would combine them together uh, in the same method that we did on the top row. And you would get this ugly looking green image. You would combine them as, as color channels and you, you get this terrible green image. And that green is light pollution. Rhodes College is right in the middle of Memphis, Tennessee. And the light pollution here is, is pretty bad. And light pollution is in the green wavelengths. So all of our images come out with this horrible look, and then you have to do some work to remove that background. And I'm just learning, thanks to Merrill and some others in this group, uh, ways to eliminate that background and come up with something kind of passable. Uh, so here on the right might be a final image, but it doesn't look very good at all. And that's because there is a ton of post-processing. Now for this particular image you're looking at, I did not do any flat fields or any biased. And that's why you can see this, these rings and this gradient 
And if you look carefully, you can see circles due to dust because we didn't do any flat fielding. We're just getting to the point with this observatory where we can start doing the flat field. And there was a plane in one of the images. <laughs> yes, and so I picked this on purpose because if you look in these red images on top, a couple of the frames actually have some planes or satellites and there are three together and they were in this first frame. And then in the second frame, they're a little bit further to the left. In the third frame there, you can just see the last trail and I didn't, with this particular data, I did not remove those images. We were just kind of practicing. Actually, this was a high school student who was doing a project for a sophomore year thing. And um, we were just interested in learning the process. So in the final image, then you do see these trails from satellites or planes. Um, I've actually seen a couple of times just swarms of satellites going through 10 or 20 moving through the frame. Um, kind of frustrating, but we are in the middle of a city. Thanks, Elon. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so I thought I would just show you some of the work we've done over the years since we got this telescope. And this is my last slide. Um, students have done most of these. I, I think I did a couple of these. But like I said, we're nowhere near, uh, you know, production quality or astronomy picture of the day quality yet. But we're getting much closer, mostly thanks to this group. I'm learning about flat fielding and, and ways to get those images and then learning how to process. And again, I'm not talking anything about the post-processing. Um, we have some people here on the call who are experts at post-processing and really drawing out beautiful, all the data from an image. Um, but here we have a picture of M1. This was done by a student as a senior project. He was the first real user of this telescope and that was sort of a final image. Um, M33, I think I did that one during the summer. It wasn't very good seeing. Um, another student did the Lagoon Nebula here. Um, I wish it had been in color, but again, that takes you know four times as long to get a really good color image. So uh, he did a beautiful job and this was actually a mosaic. So he had to take pictures in several different regions of the sky and then put them all together. Um, the Bode's Galaxy. Uh, M51, that's a color image that I first did learning how to do color. And then we have M100 here, which with, you could see two galaxies here. I just thought it was pretty. So we're, we're getting there. Um, this observatory has some issues. Like I mentioned, we have building vibration. We have planes going overhead. Um, we also have ventilation shafts um, right outside the observatory that were added to the building during the renovation. They added some animal facilities for our neuroscience folks down in the basement and the ventilation goes right through the center of the building and the, the shafts exit right outside the observatory. The architects promised us that, oh, we can certainly isolate it and we won't have any ventilation vibration or anything. And I'm not sure how successful they were with that. Okay, that's what I wanted to show you um, in PowerPoint. We, we can certainly play some more if you're interested. I'm happy to always play around. I wish it weren't cloudy. Um, I wish we could actually image something, but we're pretty socked in. I have a couple of questions. If nobody has anything else, I don't want to monopolize things. Go ahead, Freddie. Um, you have a... a, a wide field of view that will allow you to get, uh, if you have the proper filter, the solar eclipse in 2024, even when you are not going to have uh, a full uh, eclipse here, you will have a good part of it. And I wonder, given the previous experience of the college with uh, solar imaging or a study, do you have any plans for doing that? I know everybody wants to go to Arkansas. How will I know. Go? <laughs> I'm planning because I stayed here for the last one to run oh. a big event for the campus. Um, this time I wanna go and experience totality. All of my colleagues took off and left me here to run an event for a thousand people. Um, I have not seen anyone using a telescope like this for solar imaging okay. be because it's an open truss. It would yeah. be really hard to filter everything for solar, uh, put a solar filter around everything. But we, we will do something for the eclipse on campus, I'm sure. We, we have a bunch of C8s that we have solar filters for okay. and some special solar telescopes that project. 
um, last year it was, or the last time it was right during freshman orientation. So we had 400 freshmen with eclipse classes all out mm. in the quad looking up at the eclipse. But those are the kind of big community events that we really love to do. And I probably should start ordering my eclipse classes now. It's hard to believe we're already starting to think about the next solar eclipse. That's how, that's how quickly, years. less than three years. Yeah. So it'll, it'll, it'll be here before you know it. So it's never too early to start planning. Uh, a solar eclipse is an alignment between the sun, the moon, and you minus the clouds. That's the one thing I learned from the last <laughs> solar eclipse experience. You can plan all you want to. We can, we can know thousands of years in advance to the second when totality is going to occur and where, but we cannot predict until literally seconds before where the clouds are going to be. <laughs> so the clouds are everything or the lack of clouds, I should say. Um, we did have a question about CCD, just a, a question of clarity, charge couple devices. So, I mean, you know, CCD cameras and the technology that's used for imaging. So can you talk a little bit about that from the... <laughs> I'm not really prepared for that kind of question. Um, so a CCD. Um, it's basically a charge couple device. Right. So it will give you a voltage that is proportional to the amount of light striking a pixel. And that voltage is then read out. And there are different ways that you can read out from a pixel or from a CCD. Ours kind of does a row at a time, which makes it a little bit slow. Um, so it's just a material that is sensitive to light and the sensitivity is converted into a voltage, which is an electrical signal that you can then read out or, or collect. We're basically in the silicon age now. We're not in the film age. We've kind of, we've migrated past that more or less. Um, are there any other questions? You got, if, you, if you have any other questions, it's just feel free to either enter them in the chat room or, um, we just got one. How large are the files coming out of the camera? <laughs> oh, that's a great question. Um, 32 megabytes. I have plenty of files, so I should know. Um, well, uh, let's see. We have oodles of data. I'll look at some recent data. Is, um, is that 16 bit or, or 32 bits? These are 32 bit. So give this a minute here to update it. So uh, it's about uh, 53 megs. So it's big. Yeah, these are big files. Here we go. So 32.7 megabytes okay. per file. Yeah. Um, so there's another setting you can bin your image. So you can take four pixels and average them. Okay. And it kind of cuts down on the file size. So it makes it faster to, it, to and transfer. And it's more so sensitive. Yeah. It, it's also, I'm sorry? Is more sensitive when you more do sensitive. get lighting. Right. Yeah. But it does cut down on the file size so yeah. you can go a little bit faster. But you know, here are a bunch of images I took of looks like M101. Each file is 32 megabytes. And this is you know one night of observing um, 95 files. <laughs> yeah. Now what format are those those images in? Um, our camera gives us fits. Okay. And then you you know you can read them in and convert them, but our That's software. not a joke. Oh, fits. I get it. No, F I T. <laughs> um, uh, it's not showing the extension because it's a PC. Uh, that's why. <laughs> but yeah, these are fits images. Yep. I had, a, I had a general question about flats. I mean, if you're just throwing a white sheet over the cover of your telescope, could you just archive those and use those for multiple for, for different targets? Or do you have to take flats every time? Well, uh, Freddie was talking about this at our last astrophotography meeting. Um, you could, you, you know, you people will have like a professional observatory will have a library of flats, but the, the dust changes. Our mirror, the big mirror in the telescope has a fan that blows air across it to keep any stagnant air and to keep air currents away. And so that's going to change the dust on all the surfaces every single time. So to do a really perfect job, you would want to do flats every observing session. I got it. Okay. You have to do it when you're imaging the target because of where the dust is. Or after. You, you would do it after. It's the optical yeah. train. Do it at the and end of the night. So you have all the dust that has 
they proceeded on the telescope cover. Because if yeah. you go at the start and during the process, you go more dust, those will appear. Right. You're trying to, you're trying to, um, how do I say, um, not, not weed out, you're trying to filter out the anomalies, if you will, to get a more yep. pure, a purified image or pure. Right. You, you basically subtract the image data that is due to the dust. Got so you, you want the dust exactly as it was during your imaging session. So, and that's why having a permanently mounted flats box where you can just point your telescope to it, do some quick uh, exposures and get your flats at the end of the night. That's, that's my summer project, along with building a satellite for NASA. <laughs> and and, and with, a, uh, with a monochrome camera, you're complicated because you have to take flats for every filter as well. Yes. That's correct. Yep, every light train. Change the light train, more flats. <laughs> but we have a lot of students who, you know, want to learn this and <clears throat> that's part of the process is they can build up these libraries. We could also have a library of darks since our camera is always cooled. We can have a library of darks for the most common exposures that we use and that might save us some time. But we can do darks during the day, you know, just close the shutter, so. Okay, question, can you do that same thing with the biases as well? Uh, the I biases, think so. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, because it's the all camera about the sensor. It's good temperature control. If you were in a situation where you use your Canon camera, mm -hmm. then you will have it at the oh, same yeah. exposure because the temperature, temperature of the sensor is different and the readout noise is also depending on the temperature. But my, one, but my 183 that's cooled, I can bring it down to whatever yeah. temperature I need and then yeah. collect the library and away yes. we go. Yes. So a, a cooled camera can really help out because yep. you're, you're, you don't have to worry about temperature. It's always the same. So you can get your biases and your darks in the middle of the day uh, when it's not dark outside and you want to be collecting data on Actually, objects. Images. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about exposure times per for, for each each of your subs for depending on what target you're going after? So it, it just depends, you know, for something like a, a Galaxy M100, you know, maybe five minutes. If you have good auto guiding, which I'm learning, you could go much longer, <laughs> but you don't want to saturate your, your CCD pixels because then you lose yep. data. So you have to be careful not to saturate anything, but get as much information as you can. Yep. For planetary, there is a guide. You shouldn't go beyond 75% of the CCD cell. So, so uh, you, you have to calculate your exposure based on that. Yeah. One thing we'd like to do is um, be able to use this for planets. Um, it's actually too sensitive. We, we just can't we can't cut down the light enough to image a planet. So there would have to be some modification. Maybe someone in this group could help me with that someday. Because people come to our open houses and what do they wanna see, right? They wanna see Jupiter and Saturn, right? And, and this telescope is for deep sky objects. Hmm. Right. Hmm. Uh, you ought to be able to get something akin to a neutral density filter to uh, drop that down for you, just like you would with photography on regular Shots. That's what I thought. And I, I talked yeah. to the, the plane wave manufacturer folks said no, but I, no. May, I may try it anyway. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> well, they want to sell you a telescope for, uh, <laughs> well, yeah. in a, for solar system. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> I was thinking if we could cut the light down enough, then our, our shortest exposure time would be okay. And what I may try shortest, that. What is the shortest exposure time for that telescope? Um, let me check here. I'll share my screen and show you how we would actually do some imaging because it's, it's kind of fun. I think you can see that. So this is Maxim DL and I connect the camera. Um, so here's an option to turn on the coolers. And mm -hmm. so camera one is the big large format camera. Camera two is our guiding camera. Um, exposure. I would just say find a star, the shortest we can go. One millisecond. 
one millisecond, yep. but I don't think that's right. I think I've, I, it, it'll give you an error if you try to expose less here. than like 0.01 yeah, USB, or something. Your USB connection will probably conk out before then, depending on when it transmits back. So I'm glad to hear that a neutral density filter, if it's um, dark enough, would maybe help us with planetary imaging, because that's the one thing that People who come to visit, they really want to see a planet. And you can use a couple of polarizing filters, but uh, then the setup is different. Mm. And uh, you can rotate them. And with two polarized filters, you can almost reduce the light uh, to zero. Yeah. So Just the that, that's a good idea. Um, unfortunately, you know, with a big scope like this, yeah. changing yeah. the filters is a major <laughs> job. We have yes. to remove yeah. the filter wheel. <laughs> open it up and it's very, very <laughs> sensitive, change out the filters. And right now we only have five slots in our filter wheel. Ah. So if we wanted an LRGB- Maybe you can put that on the camera. Put it on yeah. the- On the camera mount. Oh, yeah, that's another I option. Don't know. I'm just I, I know. <laughs> brainstorming here. There's always something you want to try, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking of a way to stop it down. That, that would be the other option. Just so like you, you would- with you the, can see uh, on our, um, our, our sensor, it says it's now at minus 7.1 degrees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's cooling. And, and then, the guiding is also cool. That is nice. It's yeah. not. <laughs> oh, it's <laughs> not? <laughs> oh. No. It just looks like it. It just looks like it. Okay. Um, is it an off-axis guider? Is that what it is? I wish I knew the answer to that. I, is I, it, I, it, I it think it is. But it's this... not looking. It's not looking through a different telescope. It's looking through the main telescope, right? Yes. 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 So it's an OAG. Yep. Yeah. It's off axis. Yeah. Okay. I was thinking if you had a separate tracking scope, you might could use that for planetary. Right. We thought about that. We we tried like a little webcam or something, but didn't have much luck. Yeah. So maybe I can open up an image here and show you. You might catch some really good flats outside right now with the with the clouds. Uh, here's something. So it's trying there. It's opening up an image here of something. <laughs> this says M one hundred and one through the luminance filter, the clear filter but I don't see much there. So th this could have been where I was just trying to find it or oh, who knows, but this is what it looks like when we're working with this particular software to take images. Um, you, take, you, you don't use plate solving? Um, so we have, we don't do it every night. We have a, no. oh, um, do you have it? a pointing model that is built into, you can do it through the sky. You can do it through the plane wave software. You can do it through the focusing software. There okay. are all these different options. And actually, Merrill was just talking with me about doing a plate solve every night. And that's something that's on my list to try this summer. Other questions? So I got to ask you, um, and I, I, at the end of every observing session, we always have kind of like a highlight of the evening if we're out there, like what object, you know, stood out the most for, for, for many particular observing nights. So can you talk about maybe one of your favorite experiences or favorite objects or most, most memorable objects uh, imaging in this telescope? Well, the, the, the night that we first had the telescope installed and it was first light, right? For big observatories, they always talk about first light. Um, we looked at the Dumbbell Nebula and we didn't know what we were doing. We were clicking on some things, hoping we were like, how long do we expose it? You know, we don't know. We, we hit, you know, take picture and there's the Dumbbell Nebula. And that was a really exciting time. You know, a bunch of students and a couple of professors, we were all cheering in here. Um, so that's memorable. And then my, my favorite would be galaxies. I really like imaging galaxies. Yeah, galaxies are great. And of course, you need a telescope like this to really suss out detail in galaxies. I mean, it's a thrill to see them through the eyepiece of a telescope too, but they're just really just faint fuzzies. So that's where really the, the astrophotography, the imaging aspect of it is, is invaluable because you really, you really see the structure and the detail and 
and um, the richness, if you will, of, of galaxies. So, so yeah, um, one of the, really my last question is from the perspective of somebody who teaches astronomy, you know, astronomy and imaging are kind of connected because, you know, in order, the only thing we have to go by is the light of these objects. So as far as getting the story behind the object, what's going on, you know, whether you're looking at a, um, a star forming region, a nebulae, um, or a supernova remnant, or a galaxy, you know, the, uh, the structures in a galaxy. Can you talk about, just in general, the importance of, you know, a detailed image of a deep sky object, and then the kind of information you can get out of that, as far as um, teaching, you know, the physics, if you will, or the, the science of what's actually going on? I know it's kind of a vague question, but... <laughs> So um, getting information from a, a, like a visible light image or, or a picture, um, I mean, it's important to have really good images. We've learned so much from the Hubble, you know, just because of its imaging abilities, we've learned new things about galaxies and we've seen more galaxies than we ever thought there were. We've seen structures in galaxies that we didn't know existed. So a good image can lead to a lot of new science. And um, I can give a plug for my, my colleague, Dave Rupke, who's going to be presenting at an MAS meeting in October. He will be talking about galaxies and galaxy evolution, and he uses telescopes like the Hubble and the Keck. He just had three proposals approved for the new James Webb Space Telescope. He'll be one of the first users using it to study galaxies. So he discovers new things about galaxies all the time from the image but spectroscopy is the other half, right? So mm -hmm. you get images and then the spectra also gives you that chemical information that is really important. I, I think they are equally important, right? The visible image and the spectroscopy data. Absolutely. That's something one of our students wants to do is um, use this telescope to take spectra, which would be pretty exciting. Yeah, that would be exciting too. So and I know you've done a little bit of work with that also. Tom, Tom Field did a presentation back in October and I know you have his program. And Yeah, we, well, we use that in the general astronomy course to learn about spectra. But putting it on this big telescope would be probably hmm. a fun challenge. <laughs> it would be. Does anybody have any other questions for, for Ann? Well, it's not really a question. Uh, I can... Uh, uh, give a little historical context on some of the um, the, the eclipse obs uh, eclipse trips that uh, were taken in the 60s. I was a student at uh, Southwestern now Rhodes in 1963 and, uh, and some of you have heard this story but uh, it's uh, it, it's a it's a really good one and I'll keep it as brief as possible. Uh, I was not a physics major. Uh, but uh, I had a number of friends who were, and they went on these eclipse observation, eclipse trips, including the one to Alaska that you showed with uh, Dr. Rhodes uh, in front of the van and the, the big infrared telescope. Uh, Dr. Rhodes was the president of the college at the time. He was president from, I believe, 1948 until 1965 or six. And uh, he, uh, he was, as far as I know, he was not actively teaching physics during that time. Dr. Jack Taylor was the, the uh, department chair at that time. And uh, Dr. Taylor's field was infrared. Uh, he had started his career during World War II uh, doing infrared research for the Navy. And he kept up that sort of thing. Um, and uh, uh, I had, as I say, I had friends who went on these eclipse trips and they took a lot of careful observations of the eclipsed sun and the corona and they collected a lot of data and the data just disappeared. They did not know what happened to it. Uh, there was a, a, a file cabinet that was kept locked in a locked room in the basement of not that building, which didn't exist at the time. It was in uh, I think it's now called Kennedy Hall. It, it, was, it housed physics and chemistry and biology at that time. And, uh, all, and all this, you know, double secret uh, hidden material, they never knew what they, what the, they, anyone did with the data they collected 
all these infrared observations until many years later. And I, I got this story from one of the participants who, uh, you know, a fellow student, a friend of mine who told this story at our 30th class reunion in 1994. Um, and uh, uh, they, they, somebody who was in charge of the reunion says, Does anybody have any stories that maybe nobody's ever heard about when we were students there? He said, well, yeah, I got one. Uh, and he said that uh, he kind of forgot about what they did during these eclipse trips until in uh, January, February, 1991, during the first Gulf War, he was watching coverage of the, uh, the, the air war over Iraq with a neighbor. And during the, uh, the, the news broadcast and some of the documentary, they showed uh, some air-to-air -air combat, which included Sidewinder missiles. And the friend said, that's a heat-seeking missile, isn't it? Friend said, yeah. He said, why doesn't it chase the sun instead of going after aircraft engines? And my friend said, and then I knew what we were doing because Dr. Taylor had a contract with the Air Force to collect this information. And what he did was collect information about uh, infrared, the infrared spectrum that was emitted by the sun and the solar corona and this went into the making, the designing of the heat seeking missile, the Sidewinder, so that it would ignore all of the spectrum, the infrared spectrum, except the spectrum that is emitted by, uh, emitted by a jet engine. And it would chase that. And he said, so that's what we did. And that was classified. So all this came out eventually in the Rhodes uh, alumni magazine a few years ago. It had been declassified, but that was one of the one of the, the things that uh, just really stuck out in my mind because I, you know, I knew I knew a lot of people that did it, and uh, uh, I, I didn't know Dr. Rhodes personally very well. I, I, in fact, I ran into him at a, uh, a seminar that was held at the college. He had been long retired, and I'd long since graduated, and I, I'd become interested in astronomy in particular the sun, which is still my main interest. And uh, Dr. Jack Street, who was then the, I think he was the head of the uh, High Altitude Observatory at Boulder, Colorado. Uh, and he had gotten into the then new field of solar seismology. And he was gonna give a talk on this. So I took the afternoon off and, and went to, uh, to hear the, the speech. and. So Dr. Rhodes comes in and he came and sat down beside me and, you know, very friendly. He says, hi, I'm Peyton Rhodes. And I said, yes, sir, I know. Uh, you handed me my, my diploma. Uh, and he said, oh, when was that? And I told him and uh, he said, well, you're a physics major. And I said, uh, I said, no, I was a psychology major. And he said, oh, you know, like it's, it's <laughs> disappointing, uh, disappointing reaction. Uh, but anyway, I said, but I had a lot of friends who were and said, we talked about them some. And uh, uh, anyway, he was a very engaging uh, uh, figure. But uh, yeah, he, he was on that trip. And there was oh, there's some people that went to India, they went some uh, several places I, I can't remember now. But that was, uh, that was the purpose of some of the infrared observations that they made on these eclipse trips uh, back 60 years ago. Wow. I, I wasn't aware of that history. So just asking the right questions, huh? So. Yeah, uh, yeah and it, it, was, it was super secret when it was going on. And uh, they, they did not let on to the students what they, what they did with the data they collected. And my friend finally figured it out um, when his friend asked him that question, why, why doesn't the Sidewinder missile chase the sun? Yeah, change everything. Take a moment. Yep. That, uh, yeah, that's a pivotal moment, literally. Yeah. Wow, what a rich history. I had no idea. So, yeah, some exciting stuff, exciting stuff going on. In the yeah, it was an interesting time. <laughs> Very interesting time. So. Well, I am going to um, 
home the telescope and close the dome if anybody wants to watch. Um, sure. We did okay. have one other question here. Oh, for go me. ahead. Um, what's the furthest object the team at Rhodes has been able to observe? Boy, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Um, we've looked at a lot of galaxies, so you know they they vary in distance. But I've never like cataloged the distance to every object we've looked at. That sounds like a great student project. See the yeah. furthest thing that you can mm. see. Um, so I'm going to send the telescope home and the dome will follow and it'll be very noisy in here, but I can mute it if, if people want to keep talking, just let me know. For the record, we don't hear the noise, no. so we're not sure exactly what you're talking about. But <laughs> okay. We've got some it's not coming, not coming through my mic. Okay. Yeah. See, right now we can't we hear, don't hear anything. No. You, you will in a minute. <laughs> nope. Hmm. So you can't hear the dome? No. no okay. We don't hear that at it's all. Quiet as a mouse. Yeah. <laughs> that noise canceling stuff works. It does. You have excellent noise canceling technology. So now it's going home. You're putting going it home, and it points. Our home position is north. It doesn't have to be, but it is. And now I'm going to close the dome as soon as the, it finishes this action. So you can see that dropout panel on the bottom that is not open. Okay, I will close the dome now. I'm getting a lot of comments here. Wow, that moves fast. <laughs> yep. So now the slit is closing. I'll tilt it up. You can oh. see it start to close. So it just takes a couple of minutes to put it in the home position and then mm -hmm. to shut it, shut it down. Oh, well, there it goes. If it starts, well, if it starts raining, it will take a while to. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, if it starts raining, it's because you were, you know, chasing <laughs> the rain. <laughs> you know? There, you can kind of see it coming down. <laughs> So some of my biggest fears are um, to be logged in from home and the campus has a power outage yeah. and I have no way to shut the, the dome. We, we do have a crank that we can hook up and do it manually, but um, it takes me 30 minutes to get here from home. So <laughs> I guess be... I, I would have to have some students come up here and, and do it. <laughs> yeah, that would be rough. We got another question here. This is probably an uncomfortable one, but I'll ask it anyway. I'm um, just curious, what kind of budget did Rhodes have to approve the dome equipment, et cetera? Tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or millions? Or no comment. So the entire building renovation was a $40 million renovation, and it included the observatory. I don't know exactly where the money came from for the telescope. I'm assuming a, a generous alum, maybe you know, $100,000 for this telescope and maybe another hundred for the, the dome and supporting structures. And how old is it again? Um, 2015, so we're six years. Six years old, excellent. And that's it, put it to and, bed. And we're closed up. <laughs> Very good. All right, does anybody have any other comments or, or questions? Well, with that, yeah, fantastic presentation. Getting a lot of positive feedback yes. here. He was so nice. Go ahead and give Thank you very much. Well, I hope this has enticed you to, to come and visit us at Rhodes when sure. it's actually clear and we can do some observing. Can't wait. Yeah, whether it's Wednesday night or some other night during the week, maybe ideally Friday night so you can stay out a little later. But um, yeah, we're looking forward to getting this COVID stuff behind us and getting back to normal and being able to meet live again and, and, and do these types of things, you know, open houses at Rhodes College. It is a beautiful campus. It's an impressive facility. So yeah, hopefully, hopefully sometime soon, you know, sometime in the, in the early fall or whenever we get the green light to, to get back out again, that would be, that would be fantastic. So um, with that, I am going to just share my screen here briefly.
to wrap up. Hopefully everybody can see that. So, all right. Again, join MAS.com. If you're not on our email list already, just enter your name and email. So you can go to join MAS.com or of course you can just go to our website, memphisastro.org, click the join button. I'll have links to these two documents below. That's our sky map and then also our membership application. Um, when are we going back live? Again, we're targeting July. I will tell you it's not looking great. Um, the board's going to meet soon and we'll see if we're still on for the live screening, screening of Luminous. It may not happen. We may have to delay it until the fall. So we're working on it. Let me just put it that way. And our sources at CBU are not optimistic about a live meeting until or any time this summer. So we could be virtual for a little while yet, but just stay tuned for, for updates from us. We are working on it. COVID's coming to an end. Most of us have been vaccinated and I know we're eager to, to get back out. Our, our observing sessions are back open again. We're, we're doing public outreach events and eventually we'll get back to doing our meetings live again as well. But it looks like we're going to be virtual again for, for, for the next few months. So stay tuned. And again, our website is memphisastro.org. Find us on Facebook groups, Memphis Astro. Subscribe to this YouTube channel, Memphis Astro on Society. Hope you guys got a lot of value out of tonight's presentation. I know I did. I'm, I'm really excited and just humbled, quite frankly, to be associated with some of the minds that are involved in the, in, in the Memphis Astronomical Society, not only the knowledge, but also the passion that they have for the subject. It, it really inspires me. So um, can't thank Ann enough, as well as the other members of our group, for the time and effort that they put in to make this, this organization work. It's a collective effort. An organization is an organism. You know, we're, we're connected. So um, the more we put in, the more you put into it, the more we get out. And I just cannot thank you enough for your efforts for doing a program like tonight, as well as the other speakers that have stepped up uh, throughout the course of the year. So with that, guys, I'm just going to go ahead and wrap up, say thank you very much for participating and stay tuned for notices from us soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, join our list, and we will see you first Friday in June. Have a great night, everybody.